I want you guys to think about something. <clears throat> thought about this this week. I saw this online. Several people had posted this, but I thought this was kind of cool. So think about this, guys. It's Friday. Now think back. Today's Sunday. I know that. But think back. It's Friday. Okay? Think back Friday during, during Jesus' time. Okay? What happened on Friday? Well, a few things that happened on Friday. Number one, Peter fell asleep. You remember that? So Peter's asleep. What else happened? Judas betrayed Jesus, didn't he? Yeah. Mary, she was crying. We all remember that. All hope is lost. Death is won. Satan's over here laughing. Jesus is buried. A soldier is standing by his tomb. And then a rock is rolled in place. That happened on Friday. But guess what? Sunday's coming. Sunday's here. That's an awesome thing. Amen. Would you guys go with me in prayer, please? Dear Father, we, we come to you this morning thanking you for this day and all of our many, many blessings. Father, we thank you for our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, he lived, he taught, and he died on behalf of each one of us present today and then several lived throughout history. Father, we're so thankful for that. We're thankful that on that third day he was resurrected and that he's sitting at your right-hand side this morning and Father, I pray that each one of us will never forget that. I pray that each one of us will be a message carrier for you in the world. Let us be a light. When we're feeling down, let us remember you. Father, forgive us of our sins. I pray that we each do better each and every day. Father, we're honored that you're with us this morning. You tell us we're two or more gathered in my name. I'm in your presence. I think we forget that a lot of Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesdays. But Father, we're so thankful that you are here with us today. And I pray that our service to you this morning is done in spirit and in truth. And that we will worship you in the proper way that you have planned for us to worship you. Again, Father, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the hope of eternal life. And Father, again, we just thank you so much for that empty tomb. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. If you would, let's stand. Lord, I lift your name on high. Following with this next song, Dr. Jim Hundley will have our opening prayer. Well, I guess it's not opening because we already had one. He'll have a prayer. Bound.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come together, especially today. For this is a special day. It's a day in which we choose to uh, remember, to celebrate, and to reverence the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord. We do this every Sunday, but especially at this time, we celebrate this now. And we thank you so much, Father, that we have the assurance of a life in heaven with you. Jesus took away the sting of death. He took it away. When he rose from the dead, he proved that indeed he will take us home to be with him. And one day, Father, we will look forward to hearing the most beautiful words ever spoken. Well done, my, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What a wonderful thing, Father. All Christians have this. We thank you, Father, for the preparations you have made, for the love that you've demonstrated that you have for us. We ask you this morning to uh, give your richest blessings, Father, to the Berea Church, to all the families that, that come here, to all those who are here this morning. Be with us, Father. Bless us as we continue. There are quite a number of people that are on our list for prayer this morning. We want to remember especially Betsy Bueller, Brenda Cox, Judy Gross, Joyce Holman, Brian Johnson, Wanda Linus, Geneva Mangrum, Ricky Markham, Mary Dean Martin, uh, Marlin, Dr. Roger McKinney, who is here with us this morning, uh, Brady Palmer, Deborah Puckett, and Andrea White. Father, at this time, we ask you to guide us and help us. Help us to do the things that you would have us do and help us to refrain from doing the things that we should not be doing. Be with us and help us because, Father, we must exemplify Christ in our daily lives. Many people out there don't know Christ, and the only way they will see him or know him is what they see in us not just in what we say, but in our actions. We ask you, Father, to be with us now, to bless us, to help us, to ever be present with us. We thank you, Father, so much for Jesus, and it's in holy, is his holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Scripture reading this morning is 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verses 16 through 19. <clears throat> if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still under condemnation for your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ have perished. And if we have hope in Christ only for this life, we are the most miserable people in the world. I gave my life for thee.
feel good. You look so nice today. What a beautiful Lord's Day morning. Thank you so much for the gift of your presence. I know we have friends and family from all over here in town for the weekend, and we're so happy to have you. I know some mamas that are happy to see you. Hope that you have a wonderful time while you're here. And what a great honor you have given our Lord and Savior that you have gathered on His day to come and worship Him. We're going to do things a little different than our ordinary this morning. You know, it's been uh, four years since we celebrated our communion in the old traditional way that we used to, where we passed the plates. And we're going to give everybody the opportunity to do that this morning. Now, some of you went ahead and grabbed a communion kit, and if you feel more comfortable using your communion kit, you're welcome to do that. But we're actually going to pass the bread around this morning, like family around the table. And if you'd like to partake out of the trays, please do so. And if you just forgot and grabbed one out of habit, <clears throat> there's a little ring on the back of the seat in front of you, and you can just put it in there and save it for later. Uh, you don't have to use these today unless you want to. And if you prefer, that's great as well. You know, sometimes people ask me about the Church of Christ, what it is, what it's about, why things are a little different sometimes than, than other churches, and those are great questions. And you'll see some of the differences in the Churches of Christ today than maybe other times. We don't celebrate uh, or commemorate Easter as a religious holiday with Lent, uh, Monday, Thursday, Ash Wednesday, and all of those things. Those are things that, that came to be after the Bible was written, became traditions of men. Not bad traditions per se. I think it's wonderful any time that the Lord is at the focal point of our thoughts and of our deeds. But we just get back to just simple church. We like to do things the way that the New Testament church did it in the first century. And one of the things that we can see in Scripture is on the first day of every week, the disciples came together and they, partake, they partook of the Lord's Supper. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Paul comes and arrives and he knows that they're going to be gathering on the Lord's Day. So he waits almost a week because he knows they're going to be gathered as the church to commemorate the Lord's Supper together. I think it's wonderful that we, every first day of the week, partake of the Lord's Supper. And in that sense, I would suggest to you today that every Sunday is Easter here. Every Sunday, we think about the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we need to do that. And so in a little bit, we're going to take of the bread together, and we're going to reflect on that. I'm going to have some thoughts after that on the cup, and then we're going to partake of that. And then we'll have our offering later in the service. But we're going to break things up and talk about each of the emblems and what they represent and why we take them and what they mean to us as Christians today. The Lord, I believe, instituted the Lord's Supper the night that He was betrayed because He knew that we're forgetful people. Are you forgetful? I make lists. I make lists for everything I do so I don't forget. And I even have put lists in my pocket to go to the grocery store to get something and don't even get the list out and I walk off and forget the very thing I came for. You ever done that? You ever been looking for your keys and they're in your hand? Yeah, I've done that too. The Lord made us and He knows us. He also knows that we're forgetful people. And I would suggest to all of us today that of all the things that you could forget, there's one thing you better never forget, and that's Jesus Christ and what He did for us on the cross. And so He instituted His Supper. We call it the Lord's Supper so we can partake of it every week and never forget what He's done for us. It's precious. It's priceless. It's our only hope is in Jesus. So we commemorate that on the first day of every week here. Now, a person writing several years ago was talking about owning a boat down in Miami. And uh, it was back in the late 70s, and he was talking about the fact that he had this houseboat and a hurricane was coming. So he got some buddies together, and they went and bought, I don't know how many yards of rope, and they tied that boat off to trees, to railings, to, 
everything and anything all around it. He said, it looked like that boat was caught in a spider's web. But an old salty sailor happened to come up on them after they got done. He said, fellas, I know you worked real hard at that, but I just want to tell you something. That storm comes through here, it's going to tear that boat to pieces. He said, what you need to do is get you an anchor and go out in the water and anchor deep and make sure that it's hooked. It does better riding out the storm with a deep anchor. And so they undid all the stuff they had done. They took the boat out into this body of water and they anchored it to three anchor points out on the water in the direction facing the storm. And the boat made it just fine. I don't know if you're like me. My life's been rocked by a few storms. Has your life been rocked by a few storms? Things don't always work out the way we plan them to. Sometimes life throws us curves and detours, and sometimes we're rocked by tragedy, sorrow, and pain. Ladies and gentlemen, your life needs to be anchored. Your life needs some stability. Your life needs something to hold on to. Am I right? So I want to tell you that we need to anchor to Jesus. This picture represents a load, and that's a pretty good load right there, isn't it? I hope it was cotton. But I want to tell you that there are people that, that carry big burdens with them every day. There's no greater burden that you can ever carry in your life than the burden of sin. This auditorium is full of great people. I know most all of you. And you're the salt of the earth. You're wonderful people. But let me tell you something. In spite of your goodness, in spite of your benevolence, in spite of your gentleness and kindness, you got a sin problem. Anybody else besides me have a sin problem? Wow, this lesson will come in handy for the rest of you. <laughs> so I'm just going to mention a few sins and so we can get this over with. If you even committed these sins, you can just raise your hand. Let's just cut to the chase quick. How many of you have ever told a lie? That should just about do her. <laughs> the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not a person that God holds accountable for their actions that is in this room right now that has not sinned. Bible says every one of us that can intellectually know what is right from wrong and God has seen us choose the wrong or we should have done something and we failed to do it, it has been sin. And if you're like me, if all of our sins were put into a bag and we had to carry a rock for every sin we've ever committed, we couldn't even budge it. And the enormity of the grief and the shame and the disappointment of sin weighs heavy on men's souls. They might not even know why they're so heavy. They don't even know why they're struggling. But I'm here to tell you today, the reason is nothing takes away sin but the blood of Jesus. You can try to sip something to get rid of the pain. You can try to go to this place or that place and experience something that's fun and exciting and fills the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, but sooner or later, you're going to walk away and you're still going to be hurting. I'm here to tell you today, the problem of the world is sin and the remedy is Jesus. And so we need to accept what he's done in our behalf. Isaiah writing about him said he was despised and rejected of men man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our, sin, our griefs, carried our sorrows. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it is new life. Not just for him when he came back from the dead, but for all those who hope in him, for all who have placed their trust in him, for all who have given their life to him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one cometh unto the Father except by me. He's our only hope. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone in his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's about 7 billion people on the planet today, and if everybody had just sinned one time, that'd be 7 billion sins. But I'm here to tell you today, we, just, we sin a whole lot worse than that. And I'm telling you, when you think about the enormity of sin that Christ carried to the cross for all of humanity that has ever lived, it is mind-boggling. That's why when Jesus hung on the cross, He realized God was not anywhere around. For the first time in all of eternity, God the Father and the God the Son were not together. They weren't having any fellowship with one another because God placed on Jesus the burden of all of our sins. And where sin is, God cannot be. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about this plan of God is called the gospel. Paul says, now brothers, I wanted to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and by which you have taken your stand. By which also you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. You and I have a sin problem. God came up with a remedy. He sent Jesus to take our place. And when we think about resurrection morning, and we think about the joy and the ecstasy that must have taken place in heaven when Christ gained the final victory over death, becoming the first fruits of them that slept, that not only did Jesus come back from the dead, but if you believe in Him, you too can come back from the dead one day to live forever. Isn't that good news? I like to go to Washington, D.C. I used to take eighth graders there every year on a trip. There's several memorials there. Anybody know what that one is? That's the Jefferson Memorial. It's beautiful. Anybody ever been to that one? That's the Lincoln Memorial. There's a, Washington, D.C. is full of memorials, but I want to tell you something. One of the most poignant things I've ever experienced in my life is the changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. 24-7, 365 and a half days a year. Weather, no regard for it. Could be storming, lightning flashing, could be snowing, could be sleeting. It does not matter the hour of the night. There is a group of, of men and women who pace 21 steps. Pause, turn, 21 steps, pause, turn, in honor of the unknown dead that have made the ultimate sacrifice for this country, whether it was any of our world wars. And when they do this ceremony, the sergeant in charge of changing of the guard, he comes in this stern, hard tone. What you're about to witness is the changing of the guard. There will be silence. And you could hear a pin drop. Except for that one year when a school group from Canada came cruising in. They hopped off their bus and they were trying to get there before the changing of the guard, but they were too late. And they were laughing and racing and cutting up and carrying on. And the sergeant at arms stopped right in the middle of the ceremony. And he went right over to them as fast as you can march. And he said, you will be silent. And they just went, whoa. And you will remove your caps. And he clicked his heels, he turned around, and went back to what he was doing. It was moving. It was powerful. But I want you to know something. There's not any architecture. There's not any ceremony that is any more poignant or powerful or meaningful or needful than the one Jesus instituted Amen. on the night that he was betrayed. So that we would forever be anchored to the cross to remember 
that his body was given in our place. His body took our place on the cross. And aren't we forever grateful? Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of the Father who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those who he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and he will raise them up at the last day. Jesus is the bread of life. He said, you know, some of you are falling after me because you, you were fed like the feeding of the 5,000. They said, Lord, give us a sign that we may know you're from heaven. <clears throat> he said, well, you just want some more bread to eat, but I want you to know I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In just a moment, you'll have the opportunity to have in your hand bread, unleavened bread. It goes all the way back to Egypt to a time when God's people were released instantaneously by the power of God. And they weren't to make any bread that had to rise. They had to use unleavened bread because when God said it's time to go, they had to flee. And it was that unleavened bread that Jesus used when he instituted his supper. He took it and he broke it. And he gave it to everybody there so that we would remember him. In just a moment, these gentlemen are going to pass around our trays. And the beautiful thing about the way we pass around the trays is it gives you a little bit extra time to think. And as Paul said, let everyone examine himself. So as we are about to do this, I want you to think about where you're at with the Lord. I want you to think about how important it is what we're about to do. In fact, Paul says that if you eat and drink of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner, you eat and drink damnation to yourself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is important stuff. Just like them Canadian kids, they had no idea what they were doing when they come running up there, and the sergeant arm stopped them immediately. He said, you will be silent. Whatever you got going in your mind, whatever you got going on in your life, wherever you're going to do about lunch today, dismiss all of it. Take the bread. Think about your own life and realize He took your place. He died because you sinned. But He wanted you to come live with Him. I don't know if you're like me, it thrills my soul to know that somebody loves me that much. In a world full of suffering and pain and isolation, a world where people don't know each other anymore and a lot of people don't care about anybody else anymore, let us celebrate the bread. He loved you so much. He took your place. Will you bow as we pray? Oh God, our Father, we thank you so much that you made this plan available to all of us that through Jesus we could be forgiven. We're thankful that you loved us enough that you let your only begotten Son take the place of billions of people who sin and do horrible things. We're thankful that because of Jesus we can be forgiven of everything we've ever said, everything we've ever done, everything we've ever thought, all sin is washed away and taken away by the blood of Jesus. And that as we take this bread, we remember He took our place. And it's His name we pray. And amen.
And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now was the day of preparation, and the next day to be a special Sabbath, because the Jews did not because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other man. When they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. 
Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it had given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. Back in the times for the Passover meal, sacrifices were made. And whenever a lamb was sacrificed or a goat, there had to be an offering of a drink offering. It was based upon which animal, whether it was a lamb, whether a ram or a bull. And depending on the animal, dictated how much wine was to be offered on the altar with the burnt offering. In this particular case, for a lamb, it would be about a quart and a half of wine would be poured out on the altar. Poured out. You know, that that wine that they had crushed, the wine that they had preserved, the wine that they had put all that effort into, they took it and they poured it out on the altar. It was, none of it was able to be retrieved. None of it was able to be used. It was poured out. And in a symbolic way, and as you read Scripture, you realize that there's so many things that in Scripture is symbolic to get our attention. When Jesus died on the cross, blood was a part of the scene. You think about the fact that before they went and nailed Him to the cross, they scourged Him. There wasn't any skin left on His back. I'm sure that that caused it to just drip at the base of the cross. They implanted in his scalp a crown of thorns and heads bleed easily. He probably had blood running in his eyes and couldn't wipe his eyes because his hands and his feet were nailed to the cross and blood came from those wounds as well. About the third hour, darkness was over the land of the earth around the cross of the earth. And about three hours later, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, It is finished. And He bowed His head and died. They came to break the legs of of all the criminals, so you would suffocate on the cross. Couldn't raise up and get your breath. Your diaphragm couldn't open up and you would just die instantly. They came to Jesus and He was already dead. He had already given His life. And those cruel Romans, that wasn't enough. They saw His limp body hanging by nails. And one joker grabs his spear and rams it in his side and outpours blood and water. Blood is everywhere at the cross. And blood is represented here. Because you see, Levitical law tells us that there's life in the blood. And symbolically, when Jesus died on the cross, He paid the debt, which was His life. And when His blood was shed and His life was given, He became the propitiation of our sins or the price paid for our atonement. It was a bloody, gory mess. Because sin is grotesque, and a mess. And that's why you need to be with the assembly on the first day of every week. Because I'm going to tell you something. Satan is always working on us. Satan's always whispering in our ear. Satan's always wanting us to justify sin, to rationalize sin, to pretend we don't sin, to deny we sin. But sin is real, and we, we struggle with it from time to time. And it costs Jesus His very life. That's why you need to be anchored to the cross. Because every week you've sinned probably. And every week you need to be reminded, wait a minute, 
He died for that. He redeemed me from that. And I need to live for him. That's why Paul said, let a man so examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. So he does so in a worthy manner. When you take of this blood, symbolically the fruit of the vine, you need to smell and see blood. And think about blood. Because it represents his death. The price that he paid. And aren't you glad he loved you that much? In the same way after supper, he took the cup. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Our Father, we're so sorry. Some days we're not, though. Some days we look at sin rather flippantly. Sometimes we might say things that come out of our mouth that don't bring you glory. Sometimes we think in pure thoughts. Sometimes we're a part of things that we know are sinful and we don't give it a thought. But I'm grateful that we have this memorial that ties us weekly to the cross to get our attention and to remind us that if we have sinned, that it's serious and that we need to repent and we need to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that He gave for us. And so, Father, as we gather around Your table as brothers and sisters, as this juice flows through our lips, may we be so grateful that You love us that much. In Jesus' name, Amen. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 through 28. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins.
the Lord's Supper is concluded, we're now going to have the opportunity to give, and then we're going to talk about what the resurrection means to us today. There's some more trays underneath if you need them. Will you bow for me? Our Heavenly Father, we're so, so excited about today as we think about the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that we have in Him because He was the first fruits of them that slept. As we think about the sacrifice of Jesus and the victory He gained over the grave and over sin, we should be so thankful. And Lord, we are. And may our gifts and our offerings today be reflected of that, that we can carry on your work in our community and our world, that others may come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Save the chorus for last. <clears throat> Is risen indeed. We've been talking about the Lord's Supper being our anchor to the cross. And we have just a typical anchor there. But I want you to see something that maybe you've never thought about before. For in the shaping and form of the anchor is the cross. Can you see the red that shows up in the middle? 
that the cross is our anchor. The cross is what steadies us in life's storms. The cross is how we deal and cope with losing people we love. The cross is the reason that we can face our own death with confidence and assurance that there's something better waiting for us on the other side. That through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have hope. Can you bump me there? First Corinthians chapter 15. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised from the dead. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of them who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes from a man through a man. For as Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The elements of the gospel. That Jesus Christ came and lived some 33 years on the face of this earth and never sinned not one time. And became the pure Lamb of God who could be the place of all of us who are sinful. That He died that, li- that sinless life on the cross. He was buried. And that He did rise from the dead the third day according to the Scriptures. And it's in that core Gospel, those beliefs, that we are saved. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it, live in it any longer? Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We are therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I told you there's so much symbolism in things that we read in Scripture. There's so much symbolism in the elements that we just partake of. But there's also elements in the death, the burial, and resurrection that we are to participate in. Baptism. We, as we enter the waters of baptism, we die to ourselves. We are clothed with Christ. We are buried with Christ. And just as He was buried, we're buried in the water. And just as He was resurrected on the first day of the week, we are raised to walk in newness of life. And if Christ had not come back from the dead, we would would not have any hope. But because we did, we have hope. And let me tell you something. We too must come back from the dead to have hope in Jesus. To be buried with Him. To have our sins washed away by His blood. Not by the water, but by His blood. Raised to walk in newness of life. So, we are buried with Him. Confessing that He is the Son of God, our Savior, that He died for us, that we're willing to change our life, to repent of our sins, to confess our faith in Him, and be buried with Him in baptism, just as He was buried. And then we are brought forth out of the water, given new life in Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And so as we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're reminded in Scripture that the resurrection changes everything. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, it was a sad time for His disciples. In spite of the fact that He told them specifically that He was going to die on the cross, but that He was going to be raised again the third day, they still didn't get it. And when He died on the cross, they thought He was gone forever. And when the first day of the week came, the women were coming to anoint his body with spices. They weren't coming to bring resurrection buffet. They thought he was dead and he needed a little more spice. 
And when they came, the stone was rolled away. Mary thought somebody had stolen his body. She still didn't get it. But in fact, he called her by name. And she was one of the first to witness the resurrection. And I want you to know, there's no greater joy you can ever experience in this life than experience the resurrection of Jesus and to participate in His death, burial, and resurrection and to get a new start in life. Remember all the weight of the sin we talked about? We talked about bearing a bag with all the rocks of your sin in it and to realize that when you participate in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, when you accept the Lord and your Savior as, a, as you obey the Gospel, those sins are removed. Those sins are washed away. Those sins are taken away. It's as if you never sinned. I've had people tell me, Brother Kevin, you know when I obeyed the Gospel, it was like a thousand pounds was lifted off my shoulders. It's some of the best sleep I ever got. And I said, you know, symbolically, that's exactly what happened. The weight of your sins was removed. And you got a fresh new start. We have a great audience today, but I just imagine there's somebody here still carrying their rocks around. Still bearing the enormity of their sin, the weight of sin. Let me suggest to you today that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let today be your day of salvation. We have everything in readiness. The pool is fresh and warm. We have clothing on both sides for men and women. We have towels ready. You can go in there and change into these garments and in just a couple minutes, you can step down in that water declaring your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, participate in His death, burial, and resurrection, and get a fresh start on life. To have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. To be added to the Lord to the church and to have His Spirit live in you and to know your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Don't you want that? Don't you need that? Come and grab it. Come and receive it. As together we stand and sing. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to say thanks to the ladies that prepared our communion. Miss Janet prepared our bread for us. Miss Kathy Sims got our fruit of the vine ready. It was a blessing to me. I hope it was to you. And I know that the bread and the cup are a blessing to all of us every day. We are going to be dismissed. Today's a wonderful day for the 27 families that have not yet done so to get your picture made. So 
Uh, we got everything in readiness in the fellowship hall. Chelsea will be back there snapping pictures. Grab your family, come back there and get a picture made and participate in that. I also want you to know that Brother Randall Hill had to be taken to the hospital yesterday evening. He could not walk. They found out he has a problem with his hamstring. He's also having problems getting around because of his hand. And he's asked us to pray for him. So Brady's going to lead us in our closing prayer. And if you'll remember Brother Randall in your prayer. And so, so grateful for your presence today. I hope you'll have a wonderful day with your family and loved ones. And I hope you'll come back and be with us next Lord's Day where we'll be tied to the cross again and be reminded what a great and awesome God we have. What a privilege it is to be His children. My mother read me something off the internet, so I know it's true. Um, in the Bible, when they rushed in the tomb and saw it empty, the burial clothes were laying there, but the... Um, shroud or whatever that covered his face was folded up. Now, is that significant about anything? It would be to a Jew. Because when you ate at a table, if you threw your napkin down and it wasn't folded up, that meant you're through and the servant would come in and clear the plates. If you folded your napkin and laid it down, that meant the servant wasn't to come in because you're coming back. We serve a risen Savior and he's coming back. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. <coughs> Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a wonderful day it has been today, and we offer a prayer of thanksgiving today. We thank you for the rain, because it helps us to appreciate the sunshine. We thank you for cold, because we enjoy the warmth afterwards. We thank you for our enemies, for they keep us on our toes. Father, we thank you for darkness, because we know that light is coming. We thank you for death, because it brings about eternal life. Father, we thank you for sacrifice, for the hope of good, because it brings about the hope of good things to come. Father, we thank you for the tomb, because we know that from the tomb comes salvation. <coughs> Father, we thank you so much for our family here at Berea, for the relationships that we have, for the people that we love. Father, we thank you for our preachers. We thank you for our elders. We thank you for our deacons. We thank you for those servants whose name isn't, aren't in the bulletin, but are the lifeblood of this church. But Father, we also pray a prayer of exhortation. Because we know as we leave here, we're going to go spend time with our families. There may be a good meal, there may be games played, there may be basketball watched. But Father, as we leave here, we go into the missionary field and Father, we pray that You will give us strength, that You will give us courage, that You will give us the knowledge, the compassion, 
and the heart to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that we come in contact with. Father, we offer up a special prayer for Randall Hill for the struggles that he has. We pray that you'll be with the physicians who are overlooking him and that they will be able to provide answers and healing and that you will lay your hand upon him. Father, as we depart, we pray that you bless us. We pray that you give us safety and we pray that you bring us back here at the next appointed time. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.